Hi everybody, I'm Mr. Galladay and this is vodcast number two for Honors Biology at Desert Ridge High School for the 2011-2012 school year. Um, I just want to remind you of something before we get going. Uh, if you do have any questions at any time uh, during this vodcast, um, please feel free to just drop those down on the left side of your notebook uh, and that way the next time we get together in class uh, you'll have those questions there and uh, you will always have an opportunity to ask about that. Okay, uh, well, I'm going to start off with uh, this information with a uh, basically a little story that you don't have to take notes on. Uh, this is a story from, um, from the news from several years back. Um, it is a sad story, um, but it does bring to light several uh, very important ideas about uh, what makes a scientifically useful question um, and what types of questions is science not really the type of thing that can answer. Um, so there are some questions in science that we can uh, do a good job of answering and there are other types of questions which really science can't address at all. Uh, and this story, as you will see, um, has several of each of those kinds of questions involved. Um, this story starts off back in 1990 uh, with a young woman named Terry Shivo. Um, she lived in Florida, and as you can see here, she uh, it, in 1990, um, she was in her late 20s. Um, unfortunately, she had a very serious health issue. Her, her heart stopped beating. She went into what's called cardiac arrest, uh, and so, Consequently, uh, because of that, uh, oxygenated blood was not getting to her brain. So there was a, 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 a quite an extended period of time, something like a half an hour to an hour, uh, during which um, her brain uh, did not receive uh, a sufficient blood supply. Um, they eventually did get her heart beating again. She was able to breathe on her own. Uh, but after the result of this, she was really never the same. Um, she did not show any outward signs of recognizing people. Uh, she was not able to move on her own, could not feed herself, could not take care of herself at all. Um, and so she was in what is sometimes called a persistent vegetative coma, uh, which means that a person just does not have uh, any higher level brain functions that we associate with someone who's leading a happy, productive life. Um, as you can imagine, this was uh, extremely difficult on her family, uh, and they were in great disagreement as far as what her wishes would have been. Um, she did not have what's called a living will, which is instructions for what's to happen in these sorts of extreme circumstances. Her husband was of the opinion that she would not have wanted to live under that type of situation. Uh, her parents disagreed and a very, very um, protracted legal battle ensued uh, that went all the way to the Supreme Court uh, and the federal government got involved. Um, and at the time it was, uh, it was you know, front page uh, headline news uh, during the time that this legal battle was going on. Um, this is what she looked like uh, after she was in the coma. Obviously, um, you would not even really recognize this as being the same person. Um, she, as I said, she was not able to speak or uh, talk or you know respond to people in any way. Uh, she couldn't move on her own um, or, or take care of herself. Uh, eventually, the courts did decide uh, and, and sided with her husband, uh, who requested that her feeding tube be removed, uh, and after a short time, she passed away. Um, well, as I said, this is obviously not a, a, a happy story, but it does bring into light um, the types of questions that science can answer and that science can't answer. Um, science is very good at telling us, uh, for example, what uh, a person's condition is what what we can ask uh, you know what their uh, what their what their overall state of health is um, but 
science can't really tell us what the correct thing to do is, what's the morally right thing to do. These are questions that really are beyond um, what science is capable of answering. Um, so as we go through this, uh, these are the kinds of things I guess you should be thinking about, is what, are, what do we mean by a testable question? And what sort of testable questions would we ask to determine if someone is alive or not? Um, what are the traits of a testable question? What does a, a, a good scientifically useful question look like? Um, and then again, what are the characteristics or traits of a uh, question that is not really useful to science? And I think you'll see in just a few minutes that um, all of these questions we'll be answering in the next few minutes. Okay, so this is going to go on the next page in your notebook and your interactive notebook table of contents should presently look like this. Uh, pages one and two both have notes. Um, and then on page three, we'll be putting this uh, sequence of notes on testable questions. Okay, we're going to start off by looking at um, what types of questions are not scientifically useful. Um, and the, the first thing is that um, questions that deal with personal preference are not generally uh, scientifically useful. Uh, and an, an example of that is, is Pepsi better than Coke? This is obviously a question of personal preference, um, and it's not something that really we can scientifically address. Um, anytime a, the answer to a question depends on moral values, um, and I think you can see that this was very much the type of question um, that came up during the Terry Schiavo case. Um, the, the question about what is the right thing to do um, is, is very much the type of question that, um, that science can't answer. Uh, we need to look to our religion or to our moral values and so forth, um, but not really to, 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 to science. Questions that relate to supernatural, things like ghosts or zombies or that sort of thing, um, these are not questions that we can really address uh, in a scientific manner. So can we talk to ghosts? This is not really a scientific uh, question. And the reason, of course, for that is that these things relate to phenomena that can't be measured or observed. Uh, if we talk about uh, something invisible and I say, well, I want to uh, you know, measure the, the size of this ghost that you see and, you know, your response is, well, you can't measure it because you can't see him. Well, um, then it's not anything that we can address uh, in a scientific manner. Um, another example of that would be, um, is God male or female, right? This isn't something we can see, not something we can measure, not something we can observe with any instrument or uh, in, in any way. So, um, this isn't a scientifically useful question. And then the last uh, type of question that's not scientifically useful is questions that are too big. Um, why does the universe exist? What is the meaning of life, the universe, and everything? These are the types of questions that are really too big and need to be broken down before we can uh, address them scientifically. Okay, so now that we've seen the types of questions that are not scientifically useful, um, I think you can see that most of these we can sort of turn around um, and this will give us a pretty good idea of what kinds of questions are useful or what are the traits of scientifically testable questions. Uh, the first characteristic are objects, or, or I'm sorry, these are questions that are about objects, organisms, events, anything that's in the physical, real, natural world, anything uh, that is something that, that we can um, in some way measure, in some way uh, make some kind of a, a, uh, a test of that has a, um, a physical manifestation. Um, so uh, again, these are things that um, we can gather evidence um, by making specific um, observations and measurements. So if we can get either quantitative or qualitative uh, data on, on something, then obviously we can, uh, we can begin to, to study it. We can test it scientifically. 
Um, these are things that uh, questions that don't relate to either moral or personal preferences. Okay, so a scientifically useful question would uh, not relate to personal preferences, not relate to moral values. Um, and so consequently, anything that relates to supernatural or non-measurable phenomena. And then the last characteristic is uh, these are questions that have a limited size and a limited scope. Okay, so these are not the sort of what is the meaning of life types of questions, that these are things that we can uh, deal with in smaller chunks. Um, this is a common form. Now, this is not the only form that you can use for a testable question, but this is one um, that is often useful in biology. Uh, we can talk about what is the effect of some manipulated variable on some responding variable. So, for example, one example that we've been using uh, several times in class so far is what is the effect of some particular fertilizer on uh, the size of plant leaves of a particular species? Or what is the effect of um, fertilizer A on the stem length of some particular plant? Okay, this is now a, um, a specific question, one that describes both the manipulated variable and the responding variable. And so this is something that uh, clearly that we can, uh, we can design an experiment to test. Okay, so um, a couple examples. Uh, this, of course, is one that we've said that is not really scientifically useful, um, but we can still take this idea and convert this into a question that maybe we can at least test. Um, now, it may not be anything that's scientifically useful, but uh, certainly to somebody in sales or advertising, uh, this would be a useful question. Uh, and this is one, of course, that we can gather um, actual numeric evidence on. Uh, which product had more sales in 2010, Pepsi or Coke? Um, an another question that is maybe a little bit too vague um, is, can bugs smell? Um, since smelling is something that humans do uh, by breathing through our noses, and bugs don't uh, really breathe through noses, they have a different way of um, detecting what we perceive as odors, um, it's not really the right kind of question, but we can ask if crickets uh, and the common species of cricket that we're all familiar with is called Archaea domesticus, um, and we can certainly measure whether or not it responds to certain food odors. So this is a this becomes now um, a a specific question that is testable. Okay. Um, and then, of course, our classic question about plants growing better with more fertilizer. Uh, we can now just kind of specify some of those vague terms. Um, and for plants, we can pick some particular species of plants. We can define what we mean by grow better. And we can define uh, a specific fertilizer or a specific soil nutrient. Um, so one example of that would be to ask if bean plants, which are uh, the scientific name is Phaseolius vulgaris, um, does that particular plant produce more seeds as the amount of soil nitrogen is increased? And of course, bean plants is what we're substituting for plants. Producing more seeds is what we're substituting for grow better, and so soil nitrogen is the specific nutrient or specific fertilizer that we're looking at here. Okay, so here you've seen um, three examples of things that we've uh, started off as being maybe not testable questions, and we've um, just sort of cleaned them up and made them specific and made them testable. Um, now what I'd like for you to do is pick one of these topics and uh, do the same thing. You should be able to take uh, any of these, and you only have to pick one and write two specific testable questions that relate to this question. So all of these are things that are uh, a little bit vague, a little bit um, you know, problematic from a, uh, a scientific standpoint, but they're all questions that we, you can certainly clean up and uh, make specific and convert to a um, testable question. 
Okay, that's all I have for you at this time. So uh, I hope you enjoyed this podcast, and I look forward to seeing you in class. Bye.